Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. As you know, uh, agriculture in Ireland is highly influenced by national and EU policy. Uh, the Common Agricultural Policy, also known as the CAP, contains con ambitious targets for the sector while incorporating the Green Deal and Farm to Fork strategies. The current round of CAP expires at the end of this year, and the EU Parliament has just agreed to implement an extension of the current CAP until the end of 2022. So what are the policy challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for Irish farming? I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Alan Matthews from Trinity College Dublin, who is a world expert in EU agricultural policy. Alan, you're very welcome to uh, this morning's Signpost series. Good morning, Mark, and good morning to everybody. Alan, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you do? Uh, you, you, you obviously have a, a well-read uh, blog that you publish uh, very regularly on EU policy, uh, but maybe you could tell us about, about the, the work that you do. Well, I suppose my focus has been uh, on European agricultural policy. I'm now retired from Trinity, uh, so I have a little bit more flexibility in terms of my interests, but um, I do try to uh, follow developments at uh, European level. Um, I've also had an interest in, in agricultural trade policy issues. Uh, they're less um, prominent uh, today than they were maybe 10 years ago when uh, WTO and, and, and uh, World Trade Organization was, uh, was uh, you know, a household word almost in, in, in Irish homes. But um, so uh, it's been a really exciting uh, time for European agricultural policy because the, the scope of the area has dramatically widened in a very short period of time. So clearly uh, there are still the important treaty objectives of, of food security, uh, uh, of uh, viable farm incomes, but we're now increasingly aware of the environmental footprint of agricultural production, uh, the climate impact, and these are some of the new challenges that uh, we have to grapple with. Indeed. So there's uh, lots of exciting times ahead uh, on an EU level, but of course we have Brexit uh, on, the, on our doorstep. Um, who would have believed that uh, we are where we are now today? And um, I mean, uh, Alan, what's, what's your, your overall view on how the impacts of this for Irish agriculture? Well, it's not a good story, is it? Um, and all we can try to do is to minimize the damage. And clearly, uh, a free trade agreement uh, is the most important uh, uh, objective at this point in time. It won't uh, prevent uh, uh, some of the additional trading costs that will inevitably come, uh, but it will certainly help to minimize them. And if we don't have a, a free trade agreement at the end of the year, uh, then uh, we really do uh, face a very difficult uh, 2021. Um, I did see where the government has, um, or at least seems to be talking about a, a, a support package uh, for, for agriculture, and I think that's uh, perfectly reasonable. Um, I think it will be important uh, to take on board that this is not a like a temporary cyclical drop in the market that we can expect to recover after a year or two. Uh, this will be a fundamental structural change in terms of uh, the loss of our most, uh, or at least the d diminution of the attract attractiveness of our, of, of our most important uh, uh, market for, for agricultural goods. So how to adjust to that is, it has got to be a, a sort of a key uh, concern in terms of how that package is, uh, support package is used. Okay, well, look, um, I'm going to ask you now, Alan, if you could uh, share your screen with us for your presentation. And just while you're doing that, I'll just remind everybody that uh, you can ask questions uh, to, to Alan uh, or the, to, to ourselves uh, using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we do welcome uh, as much interaction from you, the audience. And uh, Alan, I'll hand over to you. So... Uh... What I'd like to, to discuss uh, with you is some of the, um, uh, the changes that are coming uh, from Brussels, so not the Brexit issue that we've, uh, we've just uh, uh, mentioned. Um, 
And these, of course, are both the, uh, the negotiations around the future cap itself, but also uh, taking on board uh, some of the challenges that um, uh, have been highlighted in the European Green Deal, and in particular, the, the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies. So in terms of what uh, I'd like to do in the next half hour, uh, I think we need to recognize at the outset that uh, Irish agriculture is not on a sustainable path at this point in time. Um, we know that greenhouse gas emissions, yes, they have uh, fallen uh, last year, but uh, the trend has been upwards uh, and they're still higher than they were in, in 1990. We know that we exceed uh, our legal limits on ammonia. Uh, we saw the EPA uh, water quality indicator report last week suggesting that uh, the, the, the water quality is, is also disappear or di disimproving. Um, and we know that from the um, uh, reviews of the uh, National Biodiversity Action Plan that uh, also uh, biodiversity uh, is still not uh, recovering. So we do have challenges. And uh, the question is, what do we need to do to address these challenges? And I suppose everyone listening is going to have their own uh, list of, of, of things which are important. But I think uh, on any list, uh, we, we need to uh, identify innovation uh, to lower the environmental footprint of uh, production. Uh, and to improve uh, the profitability of uh, uh, sustainable alternatives. Um, we uh, need an appropriate regulatory uh, baseline, no doubt about that. But we also need to reward and support farmers who adopt uh, more sustainable practices. So the question of using uh, uh, the cap payments to, uh, to farmers in a more targeted way is something which I think uh, we'll come back to in, in, in the course of the, uh, the presentation. Um, and of course, for many, uh, the, the challenges will appear as threats. Uh, and of course, we want to try to minimize those threats as much as possible. But of course, in any change situation, there are also business opportunities. And I think it's important to keep a focus on you know, what these opportunities might be in the emerging bioeconomy, uh, in terms of renewable energies, uh, in terms of carbon farming, and, and I'm sure there are other uh, ideas uh, out there. So what uh, I want to try to focus on is what might be the opportunities in the new cap uh, to support this necessary uh, transition and how can Ireland uh, best use uh, the opportunities and as, as will become clear uh, we still uh, don't have a final framework and I, I'll spend a lot of time uh, outlining the, the, the different proposals that are on the table uh, particularly in the, uh, in the ongoing trialogues around the cap. So just a, a sort of a quick uh, look back at the last uh, two or three years, which really have been uh, a, a roller coaster in terms of uh, agricultural policy making. Uh, we had the Commission's proposal for the new CAP, uh, so-called CAP post-2020, in um, uh, June of uh, 2018. Um, this promised uh, this new delivery model, uh, greater uh, responsibility for member states uh, to set their own targets, their own strategies, um, uh, but underlying this, a higher level of environmental and, and climate ambition. Uh, of course, uh, implementing this depends on money, um, so there was a huge focus on the uh, negotiations around the medium term uh, EU budget, what we call this uh, multi-annual uh, financial framework. Uh, that got stuck for a long time between um, the so-called frugal member states who wanted a, a very tight ceiling on the uh, the overall EU budget and and those uh, that would uh, that uh, emphasize the need to address uh, not just the the gap left by uh, the UK's departure um, which obviously left a big hole in the in the EU budget but also uh, the many new, uh, priorities uh, that the EU uh, needs to, uh, to, to face. 
we saw eventually in June of this year uh, an agreement. Um, of course, that took place uh, in the uh, beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic. So it was accompanied by a really remarkable uh, breakthrough uh, in terms of this uh, additional uh, funding from what's called the, the next generation EU uh, uh, recovery uh, instrument, an extra 750 billion uh, euro, which uh, will be uh, raised through uh, for the first time uh, through borrowing on, on financial markets. Just a word of warning that although uh, eventually uh, just uh, a week ago the European Council finally signed off on that uh, medium term EU budget, uh, the resources to finance it uh, still have to be approved uh, individually by all uh, national parliaments. Uh, so that process still must be uh, gone through before we can be absolutely sure the money is in place. Uh, we then had a new commission which uh, took office at the beginning of December of, of last year and its flagship proposal was this European Green Deal. And the three, uh, there's, there's many elements to it, but the three uh, that I think are most important for agriculture are uh, the climate law because that uh, will set in legislation the target uh, that Europe will become the first uh, net zero uh, continent by 2050. Uh, and will also uh, significantly raise uh, the level of its uh, mitigation ambition in, in 2030 as compared to the, uh, the, current, uh, the current plan. Um, because of the delays uh, in both the budget uh, negotiations and as a result of that uh, in the cap reform negotiations, it was clear that uh, a transitional arrangement was necessary to cover the period between the ending of the current cap, the end of this year, and uh, the coming into force of the new cap. The Commission originally hoped that that transition period would be a single year, but it, it turned out that two years uh, is necessary. So uh, we have a, a transitional regulation, which as Mark just uh, mentioned, was uh, approved by the Parliament last Tuesday. So we, we now know uh, what to expect uh, for the next two years. Um, and then the new cap will come into force uh, at the beginning of 2023. Let me just uh, focus on the outcome of those budget negotiations uh, from an Irish uh, perspective. And uh, my, my assessment is that they are quite positive. Uh, so what I've done in this slide is to compare uh, for the two pillars of the cap, uh, the direct payments and the uh, rural development programs, uh, the total amount of EU funding coming uh, in, the, in the current programming period, 2014-2020, and in the next period, uh, 2021 uh, to 27. So uh, as you can see, a very small uh, 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 reduction in, in the direct payments envelope, but that actually is more than compensated by uh, an increase in the, uh, in the, in the um, rural development, the Pillar 2 uh, contribution. Uh, part of that is because of an additional uh, 8 billion that was added at European level uh, to the uh, Pillar 2 funding from this uh, uh, recovery instrument that, uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier. And you can see that for Ireland, uh, that amounts to an additional 190 million uh, over uh, the next two years. Of course, for rural development, uh, th that is uh, co-financed between the EU and member states. So there is a national contribution. Uh, which in Ireland was um, almost as big as the EU contribution in the previous period. Uh, we don't, of course, as yet have a, um, an indication of what that uh, national contribution might be in the coming period. So I've simply put a question mark here. Um, and it will depend on uh, outstanding issues to be resolved in terms of the overall uh, percentage share of the EU contribution in the future. If we just look at uh, the, the figures for the coming year, so the, 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 those were for the, 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 the last slide was for the, the overall seven year period. Uh, again, you'll see a, a very uh, small uh, decrease in uh, the direct payment uh, envelope. Um, and actually uh, what's maybe not often uh, realized is that um, the, the financial year uh, 2021 actually pays for the payments that farmers are getting 
in this current uh, calendar year, this what we call the claim year. Uh, and um, I, I just saw on the department's uh, uh, payments uh, website um, up to the 11th of December uh, that uh, so far they've actually paid out uh, almost the, uh, the, 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 full, uh, the full amount. Um, but I highlight in particular this really dramatic increase in uh, the funding available next year for uh, rural uh, development, um, partly because of the additional uh, funding, uh, 56 million uh, coming from the uh, next generation uh, EU. So I think the, the budget situation is certainly uh, much more positive than we might have thought uh, at the outset of that negotiating process. How do we use that funding? Well, as I say, for the next two years, we now have certainty because the um, cap transitional regulation has been agreed by the parliament. It will be formally approved by the council in the coming days. Uh, so we know where we stand for 2021 and 2022. And the principle basically is old rules, new money. That is to say, uh, the schemes, uh, the, the conditions attached to uh, payments and so on uh, that farmers have been used to over the, the last number of years will simply continue uh, into uh, uh, for, the, for, 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 the, for, for the coming two years. There will be uh, uh, the possibility to reopen some of the rural development schemes. We've seen the government uh, already making announcements uh, to that effect, uh, but essentially the, the rules will not change. Um, there is, of course, uh, some uh, special uh, uh, conditions around the use of uh, that um, next generation money, the, the 56 million uh, next year. Um, I set out the rules here, but what I would say is that for Ireland, they are not uh, restrictive. They are not constraining. They don't really uh, 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 reduce uh, what we would want to use that money for uh, in any case. So let's now turn to the uh, the big issue, which is uh, the shape of the uh, the future cap. Um, we know what Phil Hogan, as the uh, former Agricultural Commission, proposed in in 2018, um, this new delivery model and also a new uh, green uh, architecture. Uh, the new delivery model is focused on a sort of performance based approach rather than the, the, the traditional compliance based approach uh, to uh, governing uh, the cap. So uh, the regulation sets out uh, uh, three general objectives and then nine specific objectives. So three of them around uh, farm incomes, farm viability, uh, three of them around the environment and climate, and three of them around uh, rural development and more general uh, social issues, including animal welfare. Um, so the idea is that member states will design uh, their cap interventions. Uh, they will do this needs assessment, which is uh, currently underway in the department, uh, to identify you know, which should be the, the main priority. So the, the, there's nine objectives, but not every objective is going to be equally important in every member state. So based on your SWOT analysis, your needs assessment, uh, we have the possibility to identify what are the, the key issues, uh, the key priorities for Ireland, and, and then we can design our CAP interventions to try to reach those uh, objectives uh, most uh, uh, effectively. Um, the Commission then will monitor uh, the progress uh, that we are making based on the indicators and um, milestones that we set out uh, in the plan. So that process of strategic planning is currently uh, beginning uh, in, 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 in the department. Of course, since the Hogan um, proposal in 2018, uh, we have since had uh, the, the European Green Deal uh, uh, um, communication from the Commission and uh, also the, the Farm to Fork and the, uh, the biodiversity uh, strategies. And I suppose the the, the, the first thing to say is that there's definitely a change in urgency, in, in tone, when you read these documents compared even to uh, what the Commission was saying prior to 2018. Yes, the Hogan proposal did try to uh, seek higher environmental and climate ambition, uh, but the, the, the rhetoric has certainly uh, stepped up. And of course, that's 
in response to uh, uh, disturbing um, uh, scientific evidence about the state of the environment, but also increasing pressure from uh, citizens and from uh, consumers. The three main documents, as I say, that are most important for, for agriculture are the climate law, uh, the farm to fork, the biodiversity. I haven't put up the specific um, uh, targets uh, that are set out in these uh, documents because I think they're, they're, they're by now fairly well known. Um, what is important to, to notice is that the, the Commission has promised to make recommendations to member states. Uh, indeed, uh, it, it, these may well come before Christmas, but certainly shortly, shortly after. Uh, recommendations as to what these Green Deal targets should mean when we draw up our CAP strategic plan. So in a sense, it will be the Commission's uh, best judgment about uh, where Ireland should be putting its uh, its cap money should be uh, should be making its priorities in the light of what the Green Deal uh, is trying to uh, achieve. Now the Commission has said that it will take the response of member states into account. In other words, how well do member states actually incorporate uh, the Commission's advice into their strategic plans? The Commission has said it will take that response into account in the approval process. Although uh, the agricultural ministers in council have pushed back against that saying that, look, uh, when it comes to approval, you've got to base yourselves on what, uh, what the legislation is and not on, 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 on targets that have not yet had any sort of formal uh, approval uh, in, uh, through the, the co-legislature. Um, and there has been this debate about, uh, should there be an impact assessment to, to, to look at uh, the, the consequences of these targets? Uh, from what I can understand, uh, the commission is, is, is uh, certainly there is work going on in the joint research center of the commission. When that will be published is, is an open question. Uh, but of course, if any of those targets were to become legal targets, there would of course be an obligation uh, for uh, an impact uh, assessment. So we wait to see uh, what the commission uh, is going to bring out uh, in the new year on that. So uh, that's by way of background. Now let's focus in on the, uh, the green architecture. And this uh, is the current um, green architecture familiar to, to all of you listening in. Uh, for pillar one, we have a, a basic payment. Uh, we have a greening payment. And for all cap payments, there is this uh, um, baseline of cross compliance. Uh, so, so these are both statutory uh, requirements, but also uh, the so-called GAIAC standards, uh, good agricultural and environmental condition uh, standards that farmers uh, must observe in order to be eligible for the, uh, for the full payment. And then in pillar two, we have uh, in rural development programs, uh, we have uh, agri-environment climate schemes, uh, which are uh, again, very familiar uh, uh, to Irish farmers. So that's the current green architecture. What the Commission has proposed is that uh, the greening payment uh, will, uh, will uh, disappear, but the greening requirements, the requirements that farmers uh, had to observe to be eligible for those payments uh, will be incorporated along with cross compliance into what they are calling enhanced uh, conditionality. So this is going to combine uh, uh, the existing uh, cross compliance with some revisions as we'll see in a moment uh, with, the, uh, with the greening um, uh, uh, element. And then a portion of the direct payments envelope will be allocated to this new uh, eco schemes, uh, which uh, are also designed to uh, uh, reward farmers for going beyond the, the, the baseline in terms of agri-environment uh, and climate uh, practices. And then in the rural development uh, programs, uh, again, we, we have the voluntary agri-environment uh, schemes as well. So what I want to do is to um, indicate to you where there is still uncertainty because uh, both the council and the parliament have agreed their negotiating position on the cap, but we don't have yet a final outcome. 
So they are engaged in what we call the trialogue process, which is this bilateral negotiations, but the commission also being present. And it's likely to take at least until the spring before we have an outcome. So I wanted just to share with you the differences between what the commission originally proposed. So that's on the left-hand side of the screen and what the council and the parliament uh, have, uh, what amendments they are uh, suggesting. Um, what I've highlighted in green are the, the, the former greening requirements. So for example, GAIAC 1 would become maintenance of permanent grassland uh, that existed, but it was a greening requirement. It would now be uh, part of this enhanced conditionality. Um, and the Council and Parliament position is to add a 5% uh, flexibility to that. A new GAIAC will be appropriate uh, protection of wetland and peatlands, potentially very important uh, in, in, in Ireland. And on the right hand side, you can see the Council proposing a somewhat different wording, minimum protection of wetland uh, and peatland by 2025. So some delay in, in introducing uh, that particular uh, standard. Whereas the parliament uh, talks about effective protection rather than appropriate uh, protection uh, of wetlands. Uh, I'm not sure, I, I can't personally see uh, whether these imply greater ambition or some relaxation of the commission proposal, you know, the difference between appropriate and effective and, and minimum, uh, but no doubt those who are uh, closely associated uh, uh, with these negotiations fight over these words uh, quite intensively. Uh, buffer strips along water courses uh, is of course an existing um, uh, GAIAC. Uh, the parliament would, would specify that these should be of minimum width of three uh, meters. Um, the Commission proposed a new GAIAC requiring farmers to engage in nutrient management planning. Some Irish farmers do that as part of GLAS or as part of their, um, uh, their nitrates directive obligations, uh, but uh, this would become mandatory for all farmers under the Commission proposal. Um, but both the Parliament and Council don't believe this should be uh, part of uh, conditionality. They would delete this. Um, for tillage farmers, uh, there's a GAIAC no bare soil in the most sensitive periods. Again, some uh, changes in wording which uh, uh, potentially could maybe uh, uh, relax or weaken that uh, requirement uh, uh, a little bit. The more controversial uh, ones are on this page. So um, the commission is proposing as a, as, as a GAIAC standard uh, crop rotation. In other words, arable farmers would be required as a condition of getting their basic payment to engage in, in a minimum amount of crop rotation. Um, both the Council and Parliament uh, wish to weaken this, um, uh, exempting small farms, um, although the, uh, the, the Parliament would say that uh, you actually have to have a, a leguminous crop in that rotation uh, in order to be, uh, to be eligible. GAIAC 9 is the old ecological focus areas. So the commission proposed a minimum share devoted to non-productive features um, uh, and the retention of landscape, uh, non-productive areas and the retention of landscape uh, features. This has been, uh, the amendments would considerably water this down. Uh, so for Ireland, that would mean extending um, a minimum share of uh, non-productive uh, areas from, from arable farms, which is uh, wh what the uh, uh, ecological focus areas uh, refer to, to all farms. So it would include our grassland farms as well. Both the parliament and the council uh, wish to basically retain the existing ecological focus area principle, uh, confining it to arable farms um, and, and, and keeping a lot of the, the, the exemptions, for example, the possibility to, to plant nitrogen uh, fixing crops, uh, so it's not completely non-productive uh, uh, land and so on. So that's, a, a, I think, an area where the Commission is going to try to push back and see to what extent they can hold on to their original proposal. And then uh, for those farmers who are in uh, Natura 2000 sites, uh, the uh, commission, a very simple 
but perhaps far-reaching uh, proposal, a ban on, on, on converting permanent uh, grassland. Um, uh, the council and the parliament uh, suggesting some weakening of, of that uh, in, in various directions. The other uh, major uh, change in the green architecture, uh, as we've seen, is, uh, are these eco-schemes. Eco-schemes supposed to be uh, mandatory for, for member states uh, to introduce, but voluntary uh, for farmers uh, to, to participate. And uh, here, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty as to what these schemes will look like uh, in the final regulation. First of all, uh, what should be their scope um, it's clear the Commission envisages eco-schemes as designed to pay farmers for practices which address agri-environment and climate issues. So the specific objectives uh, D, E and F uh, in, the, in the regulation. The Council and Parliament want to widen that scope to include uh, animal welfare, which uh, both parties agree, but also um, uh, other types of actions that would improve uh, competitiveness, uh, farm competitiveness in the case of the parliament, or general economic and, and, and social development in rural areas in the case of the council. So really, um, th that would very greatly extend the scope of eco schemes from what the Commission had proposed. So we'll have to wait to see uh, whether uh, those changes actually uh, uh, come about in practice. A second important uh, amendment is that the Commission, funnily enough, didn't propose any minimum spending on eco schemes. They were to be mandatory for member states, but, but there was no minimum figure. Uh, the council is proposing a 20% minimum. Uh, the parliament is proposing a 30% minimum. And of course, the, the concern of uh, 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 agricultural ministries and our own ministry uh, also is if these schemes are voluntary, uh, and if they're not taken up by farmers, what happens to the money that might be otherwise uh, uh, left and distributed? Um, uh, so that's an issue which is which 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 remains to be uh, to be uh, resolved. And then finally, uh, there is the question of how the payment rates uh, are set in eco schemes. So eco schemes can fund virtually the same types of practices as we are familiar with in the uh, agri-environment climate uh, schemes in pillar two. But the funding rates can be different. Uh, whereas um, under pillar two schemes, your funding has to be linked to the costs incurred or the income forgone. Eco schemes would be potentially more flexible. Uh, they could be simply a top up uh, to the farmer's basic payment. Uh, and again, it remains to be seen how that would work out uh, in practice. Uh, I want to just highlight, because I know it has been a real concern in Ireland, uh, this definition of eligible hectares. And the fact that farmers often feel they must clear uh, land because otherwise uh, it might not be eligible for payment. And I think uh, there's good news uh, uh, on this front, both the council and parliament are making proposals which would considerably uh, relax that constraint and would allow land which you know, potentially is valuable uh, as biodiversity habitat uh, to be included as eligible land and thus be eligible for payment. Uh, there's a debate about whether the 30% uh, limit uh, in Pillar 2 should remain or be increased to 35%. And there's also a debate about how, uh, how large the, uh, the EU contribution to rural development programs will be in the future. But my final slide really is just to try to bring this together and ask what are the implications for Ireland of these changes? And I would suggest, first of all, uh, it's around the level of ambition that we want to set for ourselves when we design our CAP strategic plan. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see what the Commission proposes uh, when it makes uh, these guidelines uh, uh, to, to us, or sends these guidelines to us in terms of its Green Deal uh, recommendations. Um, 
as I say, the GAIAC standards remain to be uh, finally resolved, but even when they are, they then have to be translated into specific farm obligations in an Irish context. So that's going to be uh, a, a, an important uh, focus as well, it's because they represent the baseline uh, that farmers have to meet before they become eligible for uh, the, the voluntary payments in either eco schemes or agri-environment climate uh, uh, schemes in pillar two. There's the question of how we design eco schemes. And as I say, we still don't really know what the, uh, the scope of these schemes is going to be. The commission has made proposals, uh, 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 what they think eco schemes could best be used for. Um, they include agroforestry, um, agroecology, uh, e for example, uh, uh, more ambitious crop uh, diversification. They include uh, paying for organic farming. Uh, they include paying for carbon farming. The problem I see is that all of these are essentially multi-annual things. A farmer is not going to start uh, a, a, a project uh, to, to sequester carbon, for example, by re-wetting uh, some, 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 some drained organic land, if there is a risk that next year uh, he or she isn't going to get uh, that payment. So the annual nature of these ecosystem payments puts a constraint on uh, on, on what they could be best uh, used for. And that is also, uh, I think, an issue. We'd like to see more result-based schemes, but result-based schemes by definition will have variable outcomes and therefore variable payments. And how do we reconcile that with the, the annual nature of payments in, in pillar one? I think we need to think about raising the ambition of our agri-environment schemes. GLASS is popular. But uh, it didn't. It hasn't received uh, top marks in the recent evaluations. Uh, yes, there have been improvements in habitats uh, and in, in biodiversity, but on water, on ammonia, on climate, it's very difficult to show that farms that are participating in glass are doing any better than farms uh, that are not. So we need to to try to rethink and to get more out of the money we spend in that area. And finally no matter what happens, there's clearly going to be a need for a huge effort in terms of knowledge transfer, innovation, uh, advice, and so on. These will be new schemes. There will be new demands on farmers. They will need a lot of assistance. And people like Pat and, and Mark will, of course, uh, uh, be the best to, 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 to tell us uh, what is needed in that front. So thank you for listening. And uh, hopefully, I've, I've left some time for questions. Uh, so Mark, I hand back to you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you for excellent overview of uh, where things are at. And uh, uh, you, I, I really enjoy your, your unique perspective on these things. Um, Alan, just to, to for, just to kick off the, the discussion, um, we, we heard a lot of mention about simplification uh, during uh, Phil Hogan's uh, time as, as commissioner. Uh, have you seen evidence of, of this simplification happening? I mean, you've been looking at various iterations of CAP over the years. Uh, do, are, we, are we getting any closer to a, a more simplified CAP? Well, I have to say that if you look back at the series of CAP reforms uh, we've had since McSherry in 1992, every commissioner has said that simplification is, is one of his uh, or her objectives. We, we had uh, Marianne fisher Bull as well. Um, uh, it's clear uh, to me that as we ask farmers to do more for the environment, schemes get more complicated. I, I think that that's unavoidable. Where the simplification can come in, I think, is in terms of the monitoring, the controls, the inspections, which I know a lot of farmers find intrusive and, and, and time consuming, and where potentially uh, more clever use of uh, digital technologies, remote sensing, satellite imaging, and so on could hopefully uh, remove a lot of that 
aggravation, if you like, from uh, the administration, both from the, the, uh, the department's point of view, but also from the farmer's point of view. Mm -hmm. Of course, to get to that stage, we have a lot of key issues to resolve around data protection, who owns the data, uh, how, you know, if farmers are sharing data, can they be guaranteed that uh, they still have control over their own data? So, um, you know, there are issues there, but potentially that's how I would see simplification as, uh, as coming, not in terms of the the rules around the schemes themselves because as I say when you're getting into the the, the, the nitty-gritty of, of, of uh, addressing these sustainability challenges I'm afraid uh, it, it is more complex uh, we can't escape that. Um, we're also joined this morning uh, by Pat Murphy who's the head of the Environment Knowledge Transfer Program. Pat, good morning to you. Hi, busy looking at questions here. I, I, sorry, Pat, I didn't get to introduce you at the, the outset. Um, Pat, there, there's a lot of questions coming in there, thick and fast. Um, I think we should probably go straight to those questions, if you could uh, maybe kick, kick us off on those. Yeah, uh, there's, I suppose what, a quick one. Uh, in relation to GIG, there's, uh, you talked about the removal of uh, uh, five, GIG 5, the mandatory NMP. What, have you any idea of the rationale behind that at, at Commission and uh, Council level? Hey. I think uh, the Commission and uh, the Commission and uh, sorry, the, the Council and Parliament are not necessarily against the idea that farmers should be encouraged uh, to do nutrient planning. I think they see this as something that could become uh, 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 an action that might be uh, paid for under an eco scheme or under a pillar two agri-environment scheme rather than something that would be included in the mandatory baseline. I think that's the that's the issue. It's not an opposition to the nutrient planning as such, but rather where it appears in the green architecture. Okay. Uh, could Alan comment on, on whether Ireland should move more significant resources into the implementation of CAP towards results-based schemes or traditional decoupled uh, direct income supports and what I suppose flexibility is there to, to do that. I know you, you mentioned it a minute ago about targeted schemes and the challenge there, but uh, I suppose what's your view on the level of ambition that should be there? Uh, Results-based schemes will will not work for 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 every type of uh, of um, action that we want farmers to, uh, to take, but where they can work and we have very good uh, evidence in, in the pilot schemes in Ireland on this, uh, then I think we certainly should encourage their rollout. Um, uh, not only do they seem to be more effective uh, in terms of achieving their environmental objectives, but uh, the evidence suggests that uh, they also uh, get much greater farmer buy-in because farmers can, in a sense, see the uh, results of their actions and get paid for the results of their, of their actions. As I've said, there may be a problem in integrating results-based schemes into uh, the eco schemes in pillar one uh, because of the inherent maybe variability that there are in the in results-based schemes, uh, which, which may create a, a problem for the department if they find uh, come October that they haven't got um, uh, enough take up and, and they're, they're left with some of their pillar one uh, envelope. Uh, so it's important clearly that we don't lose that funding, uh, but it's also important that the, the funding be used as it was intended to be used for environmental purposes. So I don't think we, we should simply uh, redistribute it as, as a sort of a basic income support. Uh, but one of the uh, proposals, uh, I can't remember whether it was from the council or parliament, uh, suggested that any residual funding could be simply transferred to agri-environment measures in pillar two. And the big advantage of pillar two is that it's multi-annual. Uh, so you, you don't lose the money in the year, uh, even if you don't uh, spend it. So yes, uh, uh, results-based schemes, uh, I think uh, should be encouraged uh, where, they, where they are obviously appropriate. Um, uh, I still have some, some question marks as to how well we could do that in the eco scheme, uh, but certainly in the, uh, in the pillar two scheme, in the glass type schemes, yep. Okay, a, a, a question, uh, in, or a couple of questions in relation to the, I suppose for Ireland in particular, the balance between animal and, and um, uh, um, uh, tillage 
uh, enterprises and is there likely to be any incentive one way or the other to, to, to move production? Uh... I wonder how to to uh, what, what the motivation there was. I mean, it, it clearly, uh, you can see that some of the the the, uh, the conditionality standards are more relevant to uh, to arable farmers. So you could say that they are more uh, affected by by those standards. But I'm not sure that uh, that's really uh, uh, going to be a key uh, factor. Um, uh, the the, the guide one, of course, requires us to maintain permanent pasture, um, uh, permanent grassland. Uh, 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 the rationale for that is that uh, grassland is, is, is a carbon store. If you plow that land, uh, that carbon is released uh, into the atmosphere. Um, I mean, there is, to the extent that we see uh, consumer demand shifting towards more plant-based uh, diets, if you know, to the extent that that is happening, and if Irish farmers want to be able to, 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 to participate in that, you know, the, 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 saying that you cannot plow up your grassland may actually be inconsistent with that with that trend. So that's clearly something that would need to be uh, to, to, to be uh, to be thought about a little bit more. But just off the top of my head, I, I can't see anything directly in what's coming down the tracks that will will influence that balance between arable and uh, and um, uh, livestock. Well, and there's a very ambitious targets for organic farming set out in the, 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 the farm to fork strategy. Um, how do you see that manifesting itself within CAP? Um, because uh, in Ireland, for example, you know, we have still a very low base in terms of overall organic farming. Uh, do you see any, any bolstering of, of measures there to, to support organic farming? I mean, ultimately, that's going to be uh, exactly what our CAP strategic plan uh, will will decide. So basically, there's no there's no barrier, there's no obstacle to using CAP funds uh, to support farmers in transition and to support uh, uh, ongoing organic farmers. Um, my understanding has been that there have been more farmers in Ireland who have uh, wanted to convert to organic than there was funding to support them. The scheme was closed for a number of years. I, I'm not sure exactly whether it's open again at this at this point in time. So you know, it will re it will depend. I think uh, uh, on what our what what kind of target we set for ourselves. Uh, uh, clearly. We are starting from a much lower base, uh, so it may not make sense to, to think of 25% by, 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 of land by 2030, but we certainly uh, should be uh, increasing. And, and um, uh, that will presumably depend then on the, on the uh, relative priority that we give to it uh, in, 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 the, in the CAP strategic plan. But no, right. obstac no obstacle in the, in the, in the legislation to, yeah. to doing that. Yeah. So it's an actual... A general question there, Alan, can farmers expect a significant increase in the demands that are being made on them to, to uh, retain payments and get payments within the agri-environmental schemes? That's a very uh, good question because it relates to um, the need to have coherence between the three uh, uh, I call them three levels, but they they may not be vertical levels. So you 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 have the uh, the baseline set in the enhanced conditionality uh, GAIAC standards. So so that's uh, that's your baseline in the sense that you don't get any additional payment uh, beyond your basic payment uh, for for meeting uh, the, that that baseline. Um, then uh, you build on the baseline, and the baseline is going to be higher uh, uh, in, the, in the next cap. Um, but how much higher uh, really will depend on the outcome of these trialogue negotiations. So for example, uh, will uh, there be a minimum requirement for all uh, farms in Ireland, including grassland farms? to have a minimum area of non-productive features. Now, most farms probably have about 5% in terms of hedgerows, ponds, 
uh, the, the bit of uh, uh, scrap ground uh, uh, and so on uh, around the place. Um, so if the, the guy standard was set at 5%, let's say, if that applied to all farms. So then in an eco scheme, you might sort of say, well, look, if you go from 5 to 10% of your farm, uh, that you either uh, put in um, a wild flower patch or you have uh, uh, wider buffer strips than uh, you're required under the baseline, or you have fallow land or you know whatever the non-productive area might be, then you would get paid for that additional 5%. So you can see that how much you, you will get paid for depends on what the baseline is. So that's, that's the coherence between the different uh, levels. And as I say, at this stage, because we don't know the final outcome, it's very hard to say whether uh, there will be greater ambition in the, the voluntary schemes uh, as compared to at present. The, it's the commission intention, but as I say, the council and the parliament are, are pulling back uh, from, from that. I, I suppose another uh, related question, uh, and um, I, I suppose that we, when you talk in, in terms of eco schemes and, and non productive uh, areas, uh, do you see that the requirement of, for farmers who may have uh, uh, significant levels of, of non productive areas? Do you see them that meeting the requirements for eco scheme payment, or are they are, are all farmers going to be asked for additional efforts? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean that, that that's a very that's a very uh, difficult question to answer um, because there's a trade off here between, if you like, efficiency and equity or fairness. So the efficiency argument says that, look, if you want to get the maximum environmental benefit from your eco scheme payment, then you should only pay for additionality. You know, there's, if you're simply paying for what's there already, then you're not actually improving what's, what's on the ground. But then the farmer who has that uh, 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 non-productive area will maybe rightly feel, look, uh, I've, I've, I've planned this or it's, it's part of my farm anyway. Um, why should I be penalized? Uh, why should I not get recognition for the fact that I'm contributing these, uh, these services in terms of biodiversity or flood protection or, or whatever? Um, so I think there will be, uh, I think there will inevitably be some some uh, payment made to uh, to farmer to recognize farmers who already have uh, considerable uh, uh, amounts of um, uh, non-productive areas on their on their land. Uh, it, it may be, and maybe this is the way around this. It, it might be desirable to link this to, you know, to some management criteria. So it's not just that you have. You know, you leave a, 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 a bit of your field go to to rack and ruin. I mean, you know, it may well be that with your advisor, you actually can uh, identify specific management practices which would really add value to that yep. in terms of uh, the biodiversity or uh, the water quality or the carbon sequestration or whatever. Uh, so that could be a way of combining. Uh, recogni recognizing what farmers are doing already with actually getting some improvement and, and additional uh, environmental benefit. Okay, I, uh, there's a couple of comments then as well. Uh, one kind of uh, making the point that it's important that we get the message out to farmers that there is likely change in relation to some of the, the non-eligible areas uh, potentially on the way to make sure that we, we don't lose them in the last uh, in the last period before they're, they're, they're made eligible. Uh, a couple of comments, in, and just I suppose to assure people, uh, there a couple of questions about the, the presentation. I think a couple of people didn't see it or couldn't see it very well for whatever reason. Uh, that it will be made available on the website. We usually have it up, I think, yeah. by, by, by Monday. So that's okay with, with, with Alan, that, that will be uh, made available. Mark? Uh, Alan, there's a few questions coming in here um, in relation to active farmer, that term that uh, has been, you know, used through various iterations of the cap. Are we any closer to having a, a definition of that or, 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 or should I say sort of implementation of that definition within the, the, the cap policy? 
I, I didn't refer to this in the presentation because uh, it's it's I suppose not directly part of the, the the sort of the green architecture that I was focusing on. Uh, it's still highly contested. Um, the Commission uh, tried to 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 put forward a proposal calling it sort of um, genuine farmers uh, rather than active farmers now. Um, but there's been pushback, and uh, the Council's position is again that any rules around this should be voluntary, uh, should not be set out in the legislation, and should be left up to member states. So I see this uh, as most likely ending up as something we decide as part of our CAP strategic plan. So to the extent that there are issues in Ireland that need to be addressed, we may have that possibility to do so, uh, because we will set the definition of who is eligible for the payments in the, in the CAP strategic plan. Yeah. We had a, a Patrick Barrett uh, a number of weeks ago from the Department of Agriculture uh, speaking about the, the bioeconomy. And uh, it was very interesting afterwards. There was, there was a huge amount of uh, positivity and it, it led to a lot of optimism uh, amongst uh, many of the people I spoke to after the, the presentation because it felt actually this is presenting a, a new vision for, for agriculture. And do you see uh, opportunities there for the, the bioeconomy or measures within CAP to support the ambitions uh, of, of, of the circular bioeconomy? I certainly wouldn't be as uh, au fait uh, with the potential as, as Patrick uh, would, would, would be, but um, I think the general point is hugely important that you just make. And I, I sort of said it at the outset, but it's a good opportunity to uh, reiterate it uh, that yes, um, uh, the, the, the challenges that farmers are facing in terms of the Green Deal, uh, uh, the challenge in terms of reducing emissions, uh, of uh, reducing pollution to waterways, uh, of uh, stopping the decline in biodiversity, um, uh, getting our ammonia down and so on. Uh, they, they, they can seem overpowering and they can seem as uh, simply as threats. Um, and therefore, I, I do think we need to recognize that, uh, yes, it is a period of change. I don't think uh, farmers have uh, ever not had a period of change, but it's perhaps coming more rapidly than we're used to. But change always brings opportunities. And, and uh, uh, we do need to uh, spend time and also devote some of the CAP resources to actually supporting the next generation of farm activities. It may, they may be somewhat different to what we're used to. Um, we, we, we will have to move away from you know, some, of the, uh, some of the traditional practices. Um, and we do need to make sure that those new opportunities are reflected in the supports that are provided in the, in the upcoming plan. Alan, the question there, an interesting one, might, might uh, be a whole uh, uh, debate in itself in relation to the increased standard effectively being brought about as, uh, by the Green Deal and the impact of that on, on potential trade with, with other blocks that may not be uh, uh, bringing in the same levels of standards and, and uh, uh, dist the distortion uh, that that might, might, might bring. As I say, it could be a whole... Uh, uh, <laughs> day in itself to, to discuss, but any any quick comment on on what might uh, arise uh, uh, arising from that? Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's clearly part of the debate. Um, indeed, we we see it in the more general sense in the trade agreement, the trade negotiations, I should say, uh, with the. Uh, with the UK at the moment, um, where level playing field issues uh, were, you know, have been one of the the, the last remaining knotty issues, you know, pre to, to prevent too great a divergence in standards, and and that's exactly the, I think the the thought behind uh, behind this question. Um, I answer it in two ways, Pat. One is that um, to the extent that uh, uh, what we are uh, what we are asking farmers to do in uh, the Green Deal is, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, agricultural intensification is certainly not the only driver of some of the sustainability challenges that I have uh, referred to, but it is an important one, and the EPA has made that clear. So where agriculture is responsible for these, if you like, what 
economists use the term negative externalities, but you know these 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 uh, poor environmental outcomes, if you like. Uh, then I don't, you know, I, I think uh, for their for, for the credibility of our image as a sustainable food producing nature, we have to address those issues regardless of what other countries are doing. It's in our own interest to do so. Um, uh, if we want to maintain our image of the of the green island, uh, so you know the argument that we should wait until um, uh, until everybody is on board, you know, just doesn't stand up. But having said that, the, 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 there are areas where once we do raise our standards, we certainly would like uh, to see other countries follow. Um, and for example, with respect to uh, the use of antimicrobials. Um, uh, which is a serious threat to human health uh, and something we can't really wait on. Uh, not such a, a dramatic uh, issue in Ireland as it would be in, in, in other uh, countries where you, you have larger uh, confined animal uh, systems. Um, uh, but the EU is, is, is saying in its new veterinary regulation, look, unless you actually show that you are making progress, uh, we will simply not allow your products onto our market, specifically on 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 uh, uh, antimicrobial uh, uh, use or uh, antibiotic use. So um, I, I I think there may be uh, one or two areas where we can address uh, uh, issues uh, of level playing field in a in a targeted way. But I would be yeah uh, as I say in principle. For a lot of these issues, we need to we need to 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 to, uh, to do this for our own reputation and for the reputation of our produce uh, in consumer uh, eyes. Yeah. Alan, unfortunately, we're out of time. We're actually a little bit over time, but uh, you know, really enjoyed your presentation. Very very insightful, and it's always good to get a, a an overview and to kind of step back from these things. I think and to to see what what direction we're headed. So thank you for the time and effort you put into uh, today's presentation and uh, want to wish you a uh, happy Christmas and uh, hope everything uh, things settle down in Denmark on the, the COVID side of things. So, well, so thanks thank very much for inviting me and, and hopefully people got something out of it and happy to, uh, there's an email there somewhere if anybody wants to, to get in touch and disagree or agree uh, hopefully with anything that I might have said. So thanks Mark and thanks Pat. Okay, thanks, thanks, thanks again. So uh, just to, to wrap things up, um, uh, 2020 we know has been an extraordinary and testing year for everyone. Um, we started the signpost series last April and almost 40 weeks later and 1,700 participants later, we have covered uh, a broad range of topics related to farm sustainability. I, I want to say a special thank you to all of our panelists who contributed to the series throughout the year. And in particular, I want to thank our production team, uh, Andy Boland, uh, Pat Murphy, Yvonne Maher, Noel Meehan and Catherine Keena, who have worked hard to put together, uh, I think you'll agree, a stimulating schedule uh, throughout the year. And finally, I want to thank you, the viewers, for all of your insightful questions and contributions throughout the year. And it just leaves for me to wish you and your families a happy and safe Christmas. And I hope you can join us again on the 8th of January for the start of our new season. So with that, uh, we say goodbye and uh, we wish you well and hope to see you again in the new year. Thanks again. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.